Hi there, my name is Judith Ursetti, and I'm Director of State Government Affairs at Autism Speaks. I've had the pleasure of working with families and providers in the state of Georgia for the last four years to try to pass meaningful autism insurance legislation. And today I'm going to talk about that process, and I'm also going to talk about accessing meaningful health insurance coverage in Georgia now and our vision for the future. So let's go back a little bit and talk about history. Back in 2009, there were two bills in the Georgia House, one in the Georgia House, one in the Georgia Senate, um, pursuing meaningful autism insurance coverage. And when I say meaningful autism insurance coverage, I'm talking about a bill, a model bill, that Autism Speaks generally has um, that includes coverage for evidence-based treatments, what we consider evidence-based. So things like speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, the normal things, psychological, psychiatric services, and then of course the one that we hear most about from the families, which is applied behavior analysis. Um, Autism Speaks has been working on passing legislation like this around the country for the last 10 years. In Georgia, we became involved in 2009 with a group of families and providers to get the ball moving. Um, so um, bills were introduced in both chambers of the legislature, which is fairly common. Um, and it was voted out of committee in the Senate and, and the House subcommittee. So there was movement for Ava's law. There were people in the legislature that were engaged. Tommy Williams, who turned out to be a bigger player down the road, his niece, his grandniece, Ava, um, was diagnosed with autism and he became involved. Um, and other legislators were out in front for us. Um, they also had a hearing in the House Insurance Committee, which was good progress, and we ended up making it to the House floor for a vote, which is a very difficult process to achieve. Um, Unfortunately, the House decided not to vote, but decided to do something that sometimes can work out well, but working in the legislative process, we've learned that a lot of times it's just a big excuse. What they decided to do was they decided to study, send the bill to a study committee. They say, oh, you know, we really care about autism. We really want to know everything we can about it, so we need to study it. So. This went on in 2009. No bill was filed. They were studying. In 2010, a bill was no bill was filed. They were studying, and as well in 2011, 2012. The reality is that the study committee was never even convened. They just expected us to go away. Um, but as you know, the need for meaningful autism insurance treatment does not go away. More and more children are being diagnosed with autism and Georgia families were committed, Georgia providers were committed to moving forward. So along came Ava's Law. And Ava's Law was drafted by a consortium of organizations here in Georgia. And a lot of people don't realize that. But there was a, a long process, a lot of fighting back and forth, a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, we hate ABA, you can't put that in there. Um, and a lot of people saying, we love ABA, it has to be in there. Um, until a compromise was reached and we had a draft bill. Um, and it was endorsed by Marcus, Floor Time Atlanta, oh, I said the Floor Time word, Georgia Psychological Association, Emory Autism Center, Autism Speaks, of course, Easter Seals the Ark, GCDD, Autism Society, and there were self-advocates that were involved too. So everyone had a voice, the psychologists, the floor time people, the behavior analysts, everyone had a voice, Autism Speaks was there. Um, and again, our goal was just to achieve coverage of evidence-based treatment for autism. We always say when we're trying to get legislation passed that we don't want special treatment. It would be nice, but really all we're asking for is just to be treated just as poorly as all the other health conditions. If they would just cover the evidence-based treatments for our families, it would be such a huge step. So Ava's law achieved that. It included coverage for applied behavior analysis and other therapies. Um, and it was not age-capped that I recall, um, although I, I might need to check on that. It might have had an age cap of 21. But the age was much broader than what the final result was in the last legislative session. And why is it called Ava's Law? There's a woman named Anna Bullard whose uncle, Tommy, 
It was a senator. Um, and so Anna became very engaged in this process because Ava is the type of child who responded tremendously to applied behavior analysis, a true success story. Um, Anna fought very hard to get meaningful evidence-based intervention for her, including one-on-one -on -one ABA 40 hours a week when she was just a toddler. And she went from a toddler who couldn't express herself, couldn't communicate, to starting kindergarten right with her typical peers. So when you talk about the 47%, that's Ava. Now she you know, is a cheerleader, and she you know, achieves academically in school. So this is why providers do what they do, because of results like Ava. It's not the only reason, but she definitely proved to be an inspiration. And the local media here in Atlanta really picked up on that story, picked up on Ava. Ava really became a strong self-advocate. Um, and she showed up at hearings and she spoke. But Anna truly was so dedicated. She would drive three hours to the Capitol several times a week to visit legislators and work her heart out on this issue, really kind of starting in 2013. So in 2013, the draft bill that we talked about before was introduced. Um, and we fought very hard to find bill sponsors to even get someone to stand up for our families was difficult. Um, so Anna and I worked the building and saw different people and they kept telling us to go talk to someone else who would tell us to talk to someone else and everyone would smile and nod and show empathy but no one really had the political courage to stand up and say I'll sponsor this bill and Uncle Tommy was not in a situation where he was able to sponsor the bill so we finally had two amazing legislators one was representative Ben Harbin and the other was Senator John Albers who both were willing to stick their necks out for our families and the reason they did it I mean there were many reasons they cared about the issue but they heard from a lot of constituents who said they cared about this issue and they wanted Georgia to move forward and so they took the step. There were many other legislators that took the step with them, even though, again, it wasn't something that the controlling caucus really wanted them to do. Um, but they did it, and so we applaud them for that and thank them. So what happened that year? I should go back to this slide. They sent us to be studied, which was very discouraging for the families. This time they sent us to be studied in the Special Advisory Commission on Mandated Benefits. And we didn't mind necessarily going through that process, but further delay meant further delay in access for families and lives that would never reach their full potential because families weren't able to access care. So we fought really hard to try to get around that, um, but that was really not going to happen. So we ended up going through that process. They had a long study period over the summer. We had hearings. We provided information. They divided up into different subcommittees, which was interesting. And there was one subcommittee that was made up entirely of doctors, practitioners, experts. That subcommittee recommended unanimously um, that applied behavior analysis is an evidence-based treatment and that we should move forward with passage of Ava's law. So we were thrilled with that, that the medical experts said, yes, this is evidence-based, we should be doing that. Because many people had challenged that, even though people like Dr. Lund and Dr. Lund testified and, and talked about the efficacy of ABA, it still was something that was being challenged by our opposition. So when the experts decided that it was evidence-based, they then had an overall vote of the mandated benefits commission. And what do you think happened? they voted not to move forward, even with the evidence and even with the good cost information. Um, but we just kind of said, okay, you recommended that the legislature not move forward, but that doesn't mean they're required to follow your recommendation. <laughs> so we're kind of like Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber where we're saying, you know, you think there's a chance? So we just kept on going and even with the odds stacked against us, we just reintroduced legislation in 2014. A huge thing happened in 2014 in our favor, and that was that the governor announced that he was going to add an autism benefit, including applied behavior analysis, to the state employee health plan. And there are 
somewhere around 400,000 state employees, maybe more than that. Um, so that's a big chunk of the Georgia population. And for him to take that step, and we had worked with him, and Marcus Autism Center had really worked hard to convince his staff that this was the right thing to do. Um, and for the state of Georgia to say for our employees, for our public school teachers to have access, and we're real willing to incur some cost, that just sent a huge message to the legislature. So that was that lifted us up after the Mandated Benefits Commission had kind of let us down. Um, so we forged ahead, um, and we actually ended up passing the Senate that year, which was huge. It was huge in one way because we passed one of the chambers, and getting out of committee, getting to the floor for a vote, and actually getting a vote was just tremendous. Unfortunately, in order to get there, um, there was a new bill sponsor who had the best of intentions, but basically he rewrote the bill, didn't consult with the stakeholders, and it was capped at age six and very limited. And so we had to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with all the families and providers who'd been working so hard over the years to see if they were supportive, if they wanted to support this compromise bill, or if they wanted to say, no, you know, we're going to fight for something more. And so we had, I'll never forget, I was standing outside of the Capitol on my cell phone, walking around the grass on the phone with about 50 people who had been working on the bill for years, just saying, this is your state, this is your bill, what should we do? And so there was a lot of back and forth. And then finally it was determined, we want to take a step. We, we want to try to take a step. And part of the reasoning was other states that have done this have taken the incremental approach. Um, my home state of Texas in 2007 passed the third autism insurance law in the nation. Um, and it was not an easy task. We did some political haranguing at the end. We attached to a traumatic brain injury bill and got it through that way. But it only covered through age five. It was an early intervention bill. But guess what happened? Rick Perry signed it. We got it passed in Texas, a huge state with a huge population. So that was discouraging for the community there, but also a huge step forward for providers who were able to start being credentialed by health plans for the first time and who, who were able to learn to navigate the system. There's, there's one provider who shared with me, he had an autism treatment center in Dallas and I won't share the name, but I've heard this story from him more than once, so I'll share the story. Um, and it, people exaggerate in Texas, I know that, but I think this is fairly accurate. Um, but what he told me was his treatment center, um, before the law passed in 2007, was 100% private pay. So every family that went there, and he's a board certified behavior analyst, as is his wife, every family that went there paid out of pocket, or borrowed money from their families or sold their houses or did whatever they had to do. So it definitely was a situation of the haves and the have-nots. Um, he reported to me that in 2010, by 2010, three years after we passed the very limited law in Texas, his client base had flipped and 95% of his client base was now there because of private health insurance coverage. And so eventually he ended up expanding to Wichita Falls and San Antonio and opening in other locations. So the door opened, the infrastructure was created, the relationships with the health plans, with the Department of Insurance were established. And so we moved forward. It was painful, it was ugly, and he worked very hard to make it successful. So it really was a lot it was two things. It was, of course, having the law behind him, but a provider who was really determined to make it work, um, and he did. And so that opened the door, and then in 2011, we went back to the legislature in Texas and said, we really have kids that aren't even diagnosed, you know, until they're six or seven. We need to get rid of this age cap. Instead of getting rid of the age cap, they said, you know what, we're going to go with 10. So, because we all know autism goes away when you're 10, right? <laughs> right. No, I can tell you, I have a 12-year-old and he still has it. Um, 
But anyway, so they increase the age to 10, and then Texas only meets every other year, their legislature, because they're out busy farming or hunting or playing football, you know, all the good stuff. Um, so we went back again in 2013, and they ended up completely removing the age cap. So now Texas autism insurance law is just as strong as the Massachusetts autism insurance law or the New York autism insurance law where the age caps don't exist. All three of those states don't have age caps, neither does California. So in some states you're able to do that, like in Massachusetts they did that in a couple years, passing a bill with no caps. But that's a different political reality than in states like Georgia and Texas and North Carolina and Mississippi. So in Georgia, very long explanation there. We did talk that through and decided to go ahead and move forward with the bill that was what we called the compromise bill. It was bittersweet. Um, and it didn't pass. It passed the Senate, but then the session ended before the House ever took it up for a vote. Um, and we actually, to the very stroke of midnight of the session, we were there um, thinking, you know, let's do this. And, and it was one of those times that was exhausting and exhilarating in a way because the lieutenant governor was banging his gavel and yelling to the Senate chamber, those people over in the House need to have some courage. They need to take up autism before this session ends. And then the speaker was over banging his gavel saying, those people over in the Senate need to vote on medical marijuana, and if they'll do that, then we'll vote on autism. So we ended up in this horrible back and forth um, between the two chambers, and neither one of those bills were voted on that year. So there were a lot of broken hearts again. Yes, but we persevere. I always tell my families, patience is a virtue, persistence gets the job done. And so, 2015, we came back. Um, and a wonderful legislator who happened to be chair of the Senate Insurance Committee named Charlie Bethel, he's a Republican from Dalton, um, stood up and said, I'm going to sponsor your bill. And he's reasonable, he has wonderful relationships in both chambers, so it was really one of those things that was kind of the healing process that everyone needed because there were sore feelings from the year before when there was the back and forth for medical marijuana and autism. Um, so he really was our hero and drafted a good bill. Unfortunately, when he drafted it, it was still capped at age six. That compromise was still intact. So we had to kind of pray through that <laughs> um, because we wanted to progress. Um, and we had an amazing rally at the Capitol in February. We had um, wonderful hearings in the Insurance Committee, in the Senate. We were voted out of the Senate unanimously went over to the House. We had a couple of hearings in the Insurance Committee in the House, which were a little more painful. The House still was very hesitant to take up our bill. And I won't name any names, but there were certain legislators that were, they were concerned and they, they cared about families, but they genuinely thought that a mandate was not the way to go. And so, fortunately, Senator Bethel had wonderful relationships and spent a lot of time talking through ways to move forward and so we finally were able to get to the house floor in April and what was incredible I expected to see several no votes um, and you know I was just thrilled that we were getting a vote and I knew we would pass because what we see in all the states is once you get to the floor you're golden you know people are not going to vote against autism publicly they don't mind doing it so much in committee when no one's around or maybe just not voting at all. But once you're out there, you know, we always almost get, almost always get a unanimous vote or very close. But I felt like in Georgia that we were going to get several no's because the House was still very hesitant to do this. Um, but we didn't. We passed unanimously out of the House. And there were tears in the gallery and it was just an incredible moment for people who had worked very hard. Um, and so the governor later that month signed the, the Ava's law into law, and here we are. Georgia became the 41st state to pass autism insurance reform, 41st. So in 2007, Texas was number three, and here we are in 2015, 
and Georgia was state 41. Since then, Hawaii has passed autism insurance reform, so if you think you'd like to locate to a warmer climate, although you're already in one, a more tropical, although you're kind of in a tropical climate here. Um, but if you want to go to Hawaii, they have a mandate now. And then we, North Carolina just passed an autism insurance law, and the governor signed it last week after several years of effort. So those states are going to be going through implementation, just like Georgia. You guys can help each other out. Um, so now we're up to 43 states. We have seven states that remain um, that we're committed to help. I've been spending a lot of time in Oklahoma. So if you know anyone in Oklahoma who wants to help us, there are very few providers actually there because there's no funding stream. Um, but the families are desperate, really, truly desperate. So um, that's been my focus lately is Oklahoma, the exotic travels of Judith Ursetti. <laughs> All right, so that's the history taking you back. This was not an easy process. And I always want to share that so that way when you're messing with paperwork or when you're on the phone with the health plan and you're saying four letter words that you shouldn't be saying, um, you'll remember this was a very steep hill to climb. And we definitely have more work to do. This is not the end. This is a big first step. Um, but just keep in mind that it was a grueling, excruciating process. But in the end, a lot of great people came together to take that first step. So keep that in mind when you're frustrated, because you will be frustrated. All right, so let's talk about what's in this law specifically. What did we end up with? All right, so the basic concept of the bill, and a lot of this language is pulled directly from the bill itself. Um, some of it I sort of paraphrase a little, but I like to use specific language so that way you know um, when you're dealing with denials or you're dealing with issues, you know exactly what it says. Um, and Autism Speaks will have a Georgia page set up where, where we'll have FAQs and we'll have a copy of the bill that you can reference at any time um, if you need to. So you can email me and my email information will be shared with you and I'll be happy to pass that along to you. Um, but anyway, it provides medically necessary treatment that's prescri prescribed, provided, or ordered, ordered to an individual diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder by a licensed physician or licensed psychologist. So it's very interesting to me. I've actually had families in states where we've passed complain and get really upset because they have to get a prescription from a doctor. Um, and I have to have them step back take a deep breath and say yes again let me remind you we want to be treated just like other health conditions you know a doctor's supposed to prescribe this and there's no specifics in the bill that says it has to be a specific type of doctor it just has to be a licensed physician or a licensed psychologist the bill does go on to say that they have to be able to pro provide evidence of medical necessity so as behavior analysts you're going to be fighting that battle a lot, you know, working with families, indicating that yes, this is medically necessary. One thing that health plans really like to do is maybe provide coverage for six months and then just say, you're done. Um, and we know that individuals develop a different tra trajectories and have different things that they're working on and sometimes they plateau. So just be prepared to support doctors and help them provide those arguments for medical necessity, it's a big thing. So anyway, that's why the first phrase, medically necessary treatment that's prescribed by a licensed physician or licensed psychologist. And so what does it cover? First thing is habilitative or rehabilitative services, including the magic words applied behavior analysis. So it's specifically referenced. Um, and applied behavior analysis, this is on a slide later, but I'll go ahead and talk about it right now, is the only treatment that the age cap applies to. And if you actually read the law, you might get a little confused because it was sort of pieced together and it amended a law in Georgia that had been existing since 2003 or something, a long time, that required coverage for autism that was the same as coverage for other neurological disorders but did not expand the scope of treatment. So what that meant was that it covered speech because speech is covered for other neurological disorders, OT, PT, things like that, did not cover applied behavior analysis because that would have expanded the scope of treatment in the existing plans. So getting off on a little tangent there, but that's why the age cap 
only applies to applied behavior analysis the way the law is written because it's the only really new treatment that was added. Does that make sense? Questions, anyone? <laughs> okay. Um, so keep that in mind because I think the health plans and families will be confused about that. The age cap of six is not going to apply to other services, just applied behavior analysis. And we're going to work to get that changed. But that is not a permanent cap. <laughs> All right. Psychiatric, psychological counseling services, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and then prescription drugs if they're covered in the plan already for other things. We're not adding prescription drug benefit, but if it's there, um, they're covered. And that's not something that we hear quite as much from families about. We generally hear mainly about access to applied behavior analysis. Um, and I know that you are, are interested in applied behavior analysis, but I share this with you because people say all the time, these are just ABA bills. You know, why is it just these ABA bills? You want everybody just to use ABA. And I'm sure you all want everyone to benefit from ABA as much as they can. But that's not the case. No one's taking over. You know, this is all about medically necessary care for individuals on the autism spectrum. And it covers a variety of treatments, including applied behavior analysis. Okay, so who provides? If you're a BCBA or if you work for a BCBA in Georgia, can you be a provider? And the answer is yes. The bill specifically says that applied behavior analysis is provided by a person professionally certified by a national board of behavior analysts. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> Maybe the behavior analyst certification board or performed under the supervision of a person professionally certified by a national board of behavior analysts. So that tiered delivery structure is written into the law specifically, which is great. In other states, we've kind of had to work in the regulatory process to clarify it, but in Georgia, it's there, and it does not specifically mention licensure. It just says certification. And so you will hear from health plans as you deal with them, they're going to come back to you, and the people on the phone a lot of times have no idea what they're talking about, and then their supervisors, supervisors have not actually read the law themselves. They're just reading bullet points provided. So it's really important that you know the letter of the law, and the letter of the law says certified, national certification from the BACB or supervised by. So keep that in mind because you will get pushback on that. Um, of course, all the other services that are included are provided by what you would expect, licensed psychiatrists, licensed psychologists for psychological services. Um, counseling can be provided by a clinical social worker or marriage and family therapist. Speech is by speech therapist, OT and PT, as you would expect. Um, so a wide variety of services, but the thing that I really want to hit home again is that BCBAs and their supervisees can bill insurance now. That's the way the law is written. All right, additional details. So th this is what I like to refer to as the fine print, even though it's not the fine print, but these are the things that were thrown in kind of at the end. Um, not all of them are, but a couple of them are. Um, so I want to make sure you're clear on that. So coverage of applied behavior analysis, this they kind of got us a little bit. We had compromised to 35,000. The final version of the bill reads 30,000, and it's for children six and under. So those caps, the age and the dollar, only apply to applied behavior analysis. Um, and I would say very likely most of the health plans that you're going to engage with, they will enforce the age cap, but they likely will not enforce the dollar cap um, because of federal mental health parity law. Um, and federal mental health parity law nationwide has caused the dollar caps in almost all the 43 states to be invalidated. And so I would expect to see that in Georgia too I can't promise you that, but I want to share that information with you. I definitely would push back. Do you have a question, sir? <laughs> That's okay. Come into my presentation. Come on, it's exciting. Um, so I definitely would um, push back on the 30,000 and cite federal mental health parity. And again, you can email me if you need information about that. It actually creates an argument for age caps as well. And we might start seeing those tumble too. I have not seen those tumble under federal mental health parity yet, but we have seen the dollar caps being invalidated all over the place. So something to keep in mind. Um, this is something that in some states, this language means a lot. In Georgia, maybe not so much, but it does not affect services 
on your IFSP, which is your early intervention document, IEP or ISP, which is the adult services document. What we don't want are school systems to say we're going to reduce your services on your IEP because you can just go get health insurance. That's not the intention of this law. The intention of this law is to provide medically necessary care for autism and ideally a good physician and a good behavior analyst will work together to determine the need at whatever point in time they're looking at the patient um, to prescribe meaningful treatment and you know we fight this fight when we're trying to get legislation passed because many times we hear from the legislators this should all be done in the schools it should all be done in the schools it can't possibly all be done in the schools and the families of Georgia and the providers to tell us that it's not being done in the schools um, so this is meant to provide not school-based services that are there that are federally mandated to make a student with a disability access the curriculum this is meant to ameliorate the symptoms and the challenges of autism yes there are gifts you know so I don't want to be offensive to anyone but self-injurious behavior, lack of communication, all the things that people with autism struggle with in varying degrees, that's a medical intervention. And so when you're arguing for that, make sure that you're using appropriate language, framing things medically rather than educationally. Think about your jargon um, because the goal is different. It's not to access the curriculum. It's to ameliorate the symptoms of autism. And I have actually sample redacted letters of medical necessity and things like that that I can share. And Autism Speaks is actually working on a toolkit. We love our toolkits. We have like a, a toolkit for, in the insurance world, we have one for self-funded companies. We're also going to do one now that's about how to work in the health insurance maze and how to appeal and how to do all sorts of things so there'll be something a living breathing document on our website but in the meantime if you're in the middle of an appeal you can email me and I'll send you examples from other states where we've had letters of medical necessity and I will give a plug right now too actually to our autism law summit that happens once a year um, it's actually taking place November 6th through the 8th in Mobile Alabama not too late to register. I don't know if you'll, this might be seen after that. But um, keep in touch about that too because at the Law Summit we have people come, BCBAs, providers, all sorts of people working on this issue come together um, and they share information about how they're dealing with the health plan, success stories, failure stories. Um, keep that in mind. It's a good resource too. So the Autism Law Summit is sponsored by Autism Speaks every fall. Um, we alternate. We have it in D.C. every other year, and then we try to have it in a state where we've not passed a mandate. So that's why we're doing Alabama. Um, and so I'm not sure how my hair is going to react to <laughs> the humidity of Mobile. <laughs> I'm trying to prepare for like the anti-frizz products. Okay. Um, anyway, so think about joining us. If you have questions about that, please email me. Okay, moving on. This is an important nuance that I want families to be clear on. Because I've seen some of the buzz on the interwebs, people sharing misinformation, again, with the best of intentions. This does not limit benefits that are otherwise available to an individual under the plan. So things that are already offered by your health plan, things like speech and OT and PT and psychiatric services, those that did not expand the scope, those limits that I talked about, the age six and the $30,000 cap, do not apply. And there's a specific clause that was inserted into the bill to assure that that was the case because we were concerned about that um, when we were going through the insurance committee. So language was included to be clear that the caps only applied to the poor people who do applied behavior analysis. Um, and we're going to work to get those changed. So just some misinformation there. Okay. So now we're going to talk, we talked about the meat of the legislation, what it does, um, but now let's talk about the who. Who does this help? Um, how do I know who it helps? So Ava's law impacts individual, large, and small group plans that are regulated by the state of Georgia. And it's approximately 1.2 million lives. So it, it used to actually kind of kill me, but I'd have to smile and nod and be pleasant when they'd say, oh, this law is not going to help that many people. Not that many people have state-regulated plans. And I know there are like 10 million people in Georgia, but 1.2 million lives are a lot of lives. And a lot of those lives are affected by autism. So that's a big chunk which can influence the other pieces of the pie. So 
State regulated plans matter. There has been some miscommunication about the segments of the market that are included. Because as I talked about the history, I talked about, well, we had this version in 2013 and this version in 2014. What we ended up in 2015 with um, included a lot of little Easter eggs that were hidden, which was wonderful. So a lot of people thought that the law that they were passing only affected group plans um, and mainly large group plans. However, the way the law is written, it includes the individual market, the small group market, and the large group market. Now you're going to have some carve outs and some disparity because the way things stand right now, plans that are sold on the ACA marketplace, which is federally facilitated, do not have the coverage. That's something we're going to be working on to try to get because that can make a big difference due to a lot of people. But plans sold outside the exchange technically should have the coverage. And so I think what's going to happen is this implementation rolls out. We're in, going to end up having to have some conversations with the insurance commissioner to clarify for families, because I suspect the health plans are gonna deny it first. Um, but the letter of the law, the way it's written, the code section that it refers to includes all of these things. So this is gonna be tricky moving forward for families, and we're gonna work very hard to communicate with them so they know. The law went into effect back in July, July 20, not 16, that should say 15, excuse me. It went into effect last July, um, but it didn't change plans during the middle of their plan years. So if it was like a calendar year plan, you can't change it because that will bust their elections. They can't, they can't change the plan during the year unless there are qualifying circumstances. So the coverage will kick in when they renew. Most of those will renew January 1st of 2016. Although we are starting to hear from some families now, some people have fiscal years that fall a little differently. Um, and of course, state employees, the coverage went into effect last January. So that's a big slew of people who hopefully are beginning to access the coverage now. All right, so how do you know? How do you know if the law affects you? And it's very confusing because if you pull out your health insurance card, no matter how it's regulated, if it's regulated by the state of Georgia, if it's regulated by the state of Ohio, if it's regulated by the federal government, all which are possibilities, the card still might say Blue Cross Blue Shield on it because they administer the plans. And so you can't just look at your card and know what kind of health insurance you have. So how do you know? Autism Speaks has a little tool for you. Um, so get yourself a cup of coffee if possible. Um, try to ignore your child with autism who's running around pulling your hair, doing things um, to distract you. Um, and we have a list of five questions that we'll ask you. Um, and once you answer those five questions, it's online, it's the insurance link and there's a, the address at the bottom. It will tell you who regulates your health insurance and then it'll tell you from there, if it spits out the result, you have a Georgia regulated plan, it will give you all the information about Ava's law. If you have an Ohio regulated plan, it'll give you information about Ohio. If you're a federal employee, it'll give you information about that. So the response is customized after it asks these questions. This is a tool we developed a couple of years ago because it is so confusing for people to understand what kind of health insurance they have. Will they be one of those 1.2 million Georgians who have state regulated plans or will they fall in another market? Um, so it's evolving. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on it, but if you have suggestions to make it easier, we always wanna make it easier and effective, so please let us know. But it's a great way to start. And again, Insurance Link Autism Speaks. All right, so we talked about the different types of health insurance that you might have. One would be the state regulated that we've been talking about that Ava's law will impact. But then there's also a market, um, usually a pretty big chunk of the market. This is sort of a national sample. Um, this isn't specific to Georgia, so don't look at those numbers in that way. This is just a national sort of sample about how the health insurance market is divided. In this sample, it says about 30% of, of the health insurance market has self-funded plans. And so 
As providers, you're going to hear a lot about self-funded plans. A lot, probably about half of your population is going to have a self-funded plan would be my prediction in Georgia, a big chunk of them. Um, so what that means is Ava's law will not apply to them. And this is where it's going to get a little ticky. Um, and I didn't include this in a slide. So if you need to follow up with me later, let me know. But the one little nuance with self-funded plans that I tell families about is when they go through open enrollment for their self-funded plan and say their self-funded plan is a company that does not have autism coverage. It, they don't offer it. If they have an HMO option as an option for a plan selection when you're going through open enrollment, HMOs are regulated by the state. So Ava's law very likely would apply to the HMO option. Not a guarantee, but I've seen it happen time after time where families have been able to do that. The downside is you have to deal with an HMO, which is horrible. Um, and then as providers, you have to deal with an HMO, which is awful. But you have reimbursement for coverage, so it's worth exploring. I would not sign on the dotted line you know, until you know for sure that it's a true HMO and it's affected by Georgia law, but it is a great possibility. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing that you can do is just work with your HR department and get them to add coverage. So to step back a little bit, to understand what a self-funded plan is, usually they're large corporations. Like you can see on this list, we have Georgia Power. We have the Southern Baptist Convention, which I went around telling legislators all the time, the Southern Baptist Convention covers this, come on. Um, We've got, this year we got American Airlines, AT&T, all those companies are adding autism coverage. And we've heard recently, um, and I hate to say this on tape, so I'll qualify, we're confirming, but Walmart supposedly is going to be adding it in 2016. Um, so we're trying to confirm if that's nationwide or just part, but they're outside of the Federal Employee Health Plan. They're the biggest employer in the United States, which is huge. So self-funded plans can offer the coverage. How do they do that? Well, they're federally regulated. They're not regulated by the state because, as you can see, most of these are multi-state companies. If they had to comply with every state mandate, it just would be a hodgepodge and impossible to navigate, very difficult for companies. So they're um, regulated by a law called ERISA. You'll hear them referred to as ERISA plans. Um, and so they create their own health plan. They don't go out and purchase health insurance for their employees from a broker. So no transaction occurs. There's no purchase that occurs. And so no state regulation occurs. Rather, they just have a bank account, their own bank account, that they pay health insurance claims out of. And then they usually hire a third party administrator to help them design their health plan, decide what goes into it. They can put whatever they want to in it because it's their bank account, right? There are like three or four federal health insurance mandates, like mammograms, drive-through deliveries, where you can't be kicked out of the hospital 24 hours after the baby's born, things like that. So there's a few federal mandates. But other than that, these ERISA plans, these self-funded plans, they just decide what goes in or out of their plans every plan year. So we can lobby family companies with families and with providers to add the coverage. And of course, it's a sensitive thing um, because employees often are worried about their jobs, you know, and so to go to HR sometimes takes an act of courage, and it's an, it, it depends too. Some people don't mind, and they'll just fight the fight and do it, and they're comfortable enough to do it. Others are a little timid. Um, but anyway, Autism Speaks has a toolkit. Um, this is great. It's available online, the self-funded toolkit, and it has an updated list of companies. Hopefully we'll be putting Walmart on that list soon. It's got presentation slides that you can use yourself if you meet with HR to talk to them about adding the benefit. Sa examples of letters to companies. We have information from other employees. We've got a little blurb in there from Bernie Marcus, you know, saying, we did it at Home Depot, you should do it too. Um, so, and then contact information for the team at Autism Speaks, because in addition to the work that we do in the state legislatures, we meet with self-funded companies all the time. Um, so this list that we were looking at before, um, a lot of these companies, I've been to their HR department and talked to them personally, and I'm usually there with a group of employees who are asking for this benefit. Um, and 
the way to, people wonder like, well, how do I know a group of employees? Because a lot of times people don't talk about these issues at work. I always tell them, you know, if you don't want to go it alone, have an autism awareness lunch and learn. You know, like have an event that's not specific to health insurance coverage, so it's not off-putting to your corporation. They don't feel threatened in any way. But that's a great way to find other employees. And then you just talk amongst yourselves, right? <laughs> um, and then you kind of come up with a plan. I have a group right now that has a secret code name. They have a private Facebook page, but it's employees. It's a global company, and they're working on this together um, to try to get their very large company to add an autism benefit, and I'm sure they will. Um, I mentioned before the third-party administrator that the self-funded companies hire to help them with plan language and to kind of do the paperwork for them, you know, administer all the claims and everything. So who do you think does that? Insurance. The insurance companies do it. So that's how people get very confused about their cards because they'll say, well, I have a Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. Well, that just means Blue Cross Blue Shield in their case is a third party administrator. So keep that in mind. Um, and I will say, whenever we're talking to these self-funded plans about adding the benefit, what do you think the third party administrator is whispering in the ear of HR? Don't do it! The world will end, you can't do it! Um, so we always have to be prepared to have that conversation. And with some corporations, it's harder than others. Um, but for the most part, we provide this information. We've got lots of great cost information now because we've been working on this effort for years. And the main concern usually is about cost because they have to stretch their healthcare dollars. For lots of employees, health insurance costs are rising. We get that. Um, so they're nervous. They don't want to have some huge skyrocketing new coverage. Um, so we've been able to show them, no, that's actually not the case. So that's why we've been able to get companies like AT&T and American Airlines. And now is really the time in Georgia with the new Avis law rolling out to kind of target self-funded companies here. We've been meeting with Coca-Cola for years trying to get them to do it. But now I think, you know, it'll be much easier because the law's on the books. We haven't, I haven't heard for 2016 what they're doing yet. But I think it's only a matter of time. And I, I honestly think people say, well, why don't you just get a federal mandate? And I'd love to. As I mentioned before, there's really only, I think, maybe three or four federal mandates that have ever been passed. And the current state of our federal Congress is not one of effectiveness, in my opinion. Um, so the goal in getting all these state laws passed, of course, is to send a message to the Fed saying, this should be covered by everybody. Just pass a law telling it, you know, everybody they have to do this. So that's definitely the goal. But I'd say the timing right now, that's not going to happen anytime soon. They can't even agree on what kind of toilet paper to use in the restroom, wherever that is. So federal mandate's the goal. But until then, we can work company by company. And I think, I will predict, mark your calendars, five years from now, we'll be at 90% of the ERISA market. There'll always be some outliers who are going to dig their heels in. Um, but I think that in the next five years, it's just going to be just a benefit that everyone automatically offers. We're getting there. And that's very much thanks to the hard work of providers, families, advocates who've been working on this very much like they've been working on the states. Okay. So, enough about self-funded. How am I doing with time? I didn't time myself. We're good. We're good? Okay. Um, I have... Um, I'm on slide 19 of 28. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll hurry. <laughs> okay. Um, so just some other markets that you probably have already worked with a little bit. TRICARE. Some of you have probably already worked with TRICARE. They do require coverage of applied behavior analysis. It's been a roller coaster ride over the last few years as requirements have changed. But it appears that right now it's in a good place. Um, and so Autism Speaks actually has a page for military families and for providers. If you have questions, you can email me about that. But the message here is if you have military families, active duty and retirees should be able to access coverage for applied behavior analysis. I believe they removed the age cap um, and the dollar cap was $36,000 a year. I'm not sure if they're still using that. But TRICARE has been covering it for a long, long time. The thing with them is they still kind of look at it as 
not a traditional health insurance benefit, but kind of a something else. So we're working really hard to get them just to treat it like every other medical treatment. All right, so nation's largest employer outside of Walmart is the Federal Employee Health Plan, and there are 8.2 million federal employees, and you've got a boatload of them here in Georgia, working on the military bases, civil service folks. Um, so do they have coverage? Who, what, what affects them? So OPM actually decides or guides the coverage related to health insurance for those 8.2 million employees nationwide. And they have hundreds, if not thousands, of different health plans in, in the varying states. Even in one state, based on region, you'll have different health plans under the Federal Employee Health Plan. And so Autism Speaks, working with other organizations, has been lobbying OPM for years just to add applied behavior analysis because we've been hearing from families so much that, you know, they're mailmen, civil service employees, people like that who need access to the coverage. Um, so back in, I want to get my year right, um, 2012, they urged providers to actually add ABA and backing up a little bit, why did they do that? So for a long time, OPM said, it's experimental, we're not going to go there. And they had an expert panel that helped them determine that. Um, but we just kept pushing, pushing. And so the expert panel finally came back and said, okay, it's not experimental, but we think it's educational and it doesn't belong in our health plan, so we're not going to include it. So that went on for a while. So then they finally reconvened again and they decided, no, actually, it's appropriate to use in an educational setting, absolutely, but sometimes it's also medically necessary. So, okay, we're willing to go there now. Um, but rather than mandating it in all of their plans all over the nation, what they said to their plans was, you can add ABA now if you want to. Um, and so what happened that year was about 20 states um, had plans for the Federal Employee Health Plan that included coverage for ABA. And it looked a little different in the varying plans, but it was a big step forward. So then the next year, we kind of went back to them and said, this is a nice start, but we think people might need a little bit of a nudge. And so OPM said to their varying plans, if you don't cover ABA, you have to tell us why. You have to provide an explanation. So they still, you know, they increased the number a little bit. It wasn't a big jump. I think still it was in the 20s of states where coverage was available. And Georgia was not one of them, unfortunately. Um, so fast forward to where we are now. Um, we are just now going through the plan language for the upcoming calendar year to see what states are going to be including coverage in the federal employee health plans. Um, and we're hearing it's around 30, 32 states. So it's kind of like our state legislative ex efforts is kind of going slowly and it would be really nice if they would just say, come on, just do it. <laughs> um, but we're getting there and what you can do as a federal employee in Georgia, I'm not sure if Georgia will be one of the plans that adds coverage in 2016, they might. And we'll know that in the next few weeks. We're like in the fall right now. Um, but if Georgia's not on the list, we can advocate internally in Georgia to your superiors, let them know that this is a need that is not being met and just work internally. It's a little bit different infrastructure than self-funded plans, but they're not going to do anything if they don't get a message that it's desired. So we're here to help with that as well. The nice thing too is Autism Speaks has staff in DC. They can go talk to OPM at any time and they've been working on this for years and actually made some really good progress. So that's coming. All right, so the million dollar question is what about Medicaid? Uh, Medicaid in July of 2014 came out with a memo and they stated that a provision of Medicaid that's been in existence for decades federally it's called EPSDT, Early Periodic Screening, Diagnosis, and Treatment is what EPSDT stands for. Um, they said, they looked at it and they said, you know, this should include autism. Autism is a childhood health condition. E is for early. Um, and we have provisions sort of for diagnosis, um, but we don't have provisions for the T, the treatment. And so they came out with a memo saying, okay, states, we're telling you that medically necessary care for autism must be 
provided in your regular Medicaid plans, and I'm not talking about waiver plans here, I'm talking about traditional Medicaid plans, and I'm not talking about Medicaid expansion or anything like that. This is Medicaid as it has existed for decades in our country, should have been covering this all along. So Autism Speaks, Marcus Autism Center, others have been working, um, and Georgia um, Association of Behavior Analysts too, have been meeting with the Medicaid director here, we've met with the governor's office to say, hey, we need to define what medically necessary care is for autism here in Georgia, and we need to roll out this treatment, not later, but now, because we have a huge swath of families here, the biggest swath, who have Medicaid, who don't have access. Um, but we wanna make sure that the access is meaningful, not just some diluted provision of services that's not really gonna help anyone. Um, so that's where we are right now. We've had probably four meetings with the Medicaid director's office, and they say that they're rolling out coverage for ABA. Hooray! But our big concern is, who's going to be providing that? And they say, oh, we've got people that can do that already. <laughs> and we say, no, actually you don't. You need to have board certified behavior analysts delivering this therapy, supervising the therapy, ensuring quality. Um, so that's where we are in the process. Um, and so the Medicaid director has submitted a budget proposal that's probably all gonna roll out in 2016. The big sticking point with the director has been licensure because Medicaid prefers to work with licensed providers. Is that required under EPSDT? No, it's not. And Autism Speaks and the Association of Professional Behavior Analysts, APBA, have come up with model plan language for states that have licensure and are working with Medicaid and for states that don't have licensure and that are working with Medicaid. And we've provided the latter to the director here, saying, look, you can move forward if you categorize it properly under preventive service, you don't have to have a license. They have a provision for that and you can recognize board certified behavior analysts. And other states, right now there are about 16 states moving forward um, and some of those states are actually doing that. They're not states with licensure. So licensure is not required. To make it easier though, licensure would probably be, probably be something that you as behavior analysts should strongly be thinking about. We talked about credentials for Ava's Law earlier. It was just certification. But what you'll see is you're working on this and you're working with certain self-funded plans who get to set their own roles, right? Some of them are gonna say, we only work with licensed people. So you're gonna run into these little hurdles from time to time, so I would just say, it's very likely something that you need to strongly consider. It will be painful in the short term to get the legislation passed. Autism Speaks will help you, um, but it will, I think in the long run, make your lives much easier. Think about it. Um, and in the meantime, we'll continue to provide updates about what we're doing with Medicaid. We're going to continue to push them. I suspect that litigation may be filed. Autism Speaks can't do that. We're a nonprofit. But just hearing what we're hearing from the families, I would not be surprised if that's something that happens. And that might be what has to happen in order to move the ball forward. Um, ACA, I mentioned a little bit earlier, the ACA marketplace plans right now, as you see them roll out in 2016, they're not going to have Ava's law reflected, but that's something we're going to be working on. The secret term is habilitative services. When I talked earlier about Ava's law, I don't know if you noticed, but applied behavior analysis was defined as a habilitative service. Well, habilitative service is one of the essential health benefits under the federal law, but habilitative service, the way they dis define that particular thing, they said individual states get to come up with their own definition. So I would argue that the state of Georgia has a definition contained in Ava's law. It's right there on the books, people, so let's get rolling. Um, so we're going to be having those conversations, and I'll be much more professional about it when I'm talking to <laughs> the insurance commissioner. But I think that will open the door to those marketplace plans. It's a sticky conversation here in Georgia because Obamacare is not a popular vehicle and I wanna be respectful of that. The nuance with Obamacare plans though is that they have to provide child only plans. And that means that anyone, someone who works for a self-funded company, 
someone who has, who's a federal employee, anyone can go out and purchase a child-only plan on the marketplace and then have access to potentially Ava's Law coverage. And we're seeing that in other states where families who could not access care are accessing it. It's about 30 states right now where they have the coverage in their ACA marketplace plans. They can purchase the child-only plan just for that child, maintain their own coverage if they have it. Um, they have to pay the premiums and they won't get a subsidy, but usually that cost benefit is a lot. I mean, it's a no-brainer. So, that's why we're going to continue to work on this part of the law too and probably be having some technical conversations about habilitative services and how George is defining it so stay tuned okay how much time do I have to talk about dealing with appeals five minutes, five minutes. okay all right so the one thing that the ACA does that does impact all health plans state regulated federally regulated ACA and non ACA is that all health plans have to have a two steps appeal process internal review and external review so internal review is when you appeal within the health plan when you've been wrongfully denied um, and then external is when they have upheld that denial and then you go to an external review and you kind of coordinate that with the state department of insurance um, so I would expect to be denied and I did a phone call recently with some Georgia families talking about rollout and I said you should all expect to have everything denied up front just expect the worst don't expect them to comply with the law for the health insurance plans it's very much like a speed limit sign they're gonna ignore it until someone pulls them over and so that's why we're trying to watch them closely and you need to know how to work in that system so don't give up be organized document all communications name, title of person you're talking to, date, time of contact, always get a reference number, ask them for a reference number and get it, um, and then follow up, verify receipt of appeal, and ask for a new claim number. Um, and specifically in Georgia, under Georgia law, an insurance company must pay, deny, or request additional information within 15 working days of receipt of an insurance claim. So that's a law they have to respond within 15 days. If they don't, then they could be charged a penalty of 18% 18, 18 per annum beginning on the 16th working day. Now, will that automatically happen? No, as a consumer, as a provider, you're gonna have to push for that. You're gonna have to communicate with the Department of Insurance when there's a problem. Let them know. Um, I would say that the commissioner and his staff, they were great and they actually were neutral on Ava's Law, which was really helpful for us. Um, but I would say they're not super aggressive um, in going after the health plans. We're going to have to bring things to their attention in a very detailed way. So they have a consumer complaint portal on um, the website oci.ga.gov. They also have FAQs about health insurance claims and what you should expect. You can call them between the hours of 8 and 7. Um, but just know that you should complain to the Department of Insurance. And the reason I tell you this is a lot of times people are hesitant to do that. But what happens with these folks is once they see trends and they see certain health plans always denying after six months of ABA, when they develop those trends, then they end up auditing those health plans. And the health plans hate to be audited. They hate it. So that's when you kind of get results. But what we hear a lot of times from the commissioners are, we're not hearing from people. No one's complaining. So complain. Complain, complain, complain. Even if they write you back and say, your complaint's not valid, it does not hurt to complain. File a complaint, make it a daily habit. <laughs> say your prayers and file a complaint with the Department of Insurance. Um, okay, and then finally, this is just a short little nuance, but it's something I've been seeing a lot around the country with the release of the DSM-5, which has been a while. Do you have to get a new diagnosis because of the DSM-5? No, you do not. And some of the health plans are requiring families, they're suspending services and telling them they have to go back and get a new diagnosis, which sometimes could take months to get into a provider. That's not accurate. Um, in the DSM, there's provision for carryover if you had a diagnosis before under the DSM-4. So just be aware of that and push back on that. And the health plans, when we have pushed back, have stepped back but some of them are trying to do this to families and providers and so that's a problem any questions I work as part of an amazing team Lori Unum is my supervisor and mentor and then my co colleague is Mike Wasmer who's also amazing and we just kind of split duties so if you ever have a question 
you can actually email all three of us and then whichever one of us is available um, will respond quickly and I will say too don't hesitate to email and um, I will get back to you if I don't email me again because I want to so thank you so much <laughs> that was really long <laughs> you're gonna have to edit um, I'm just gonna use the microphone so that they'll be able to hear me online thank you that is really gonna be helpful for everyone in Georgia um, and I just want to reiterate that obviously um, her contact information is there but we'll make sure everybody gets right. everything that you mentioned and we'll make that available for our members um, I also wanted to just follow up I I think you mentioned several times that Autism Speaks would continue to be involved with all this so Absolutely. I guess my big question was is that going to happen but I think you made it clear that that's going to be true um, and it, um, you mentioned a little bit about licensure. One of the other um, presentations that will be a part of this package will actually be a, a presentation on licensure because Scava has been, Good. In, you know, kind of working behind the scenes on that. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and, and hopefully that will provide some more impetus for all of us to kind of get on that bandwagon. You can do it. But it's, it's definitely sounds like that's important. So. Yeah. Um, we really appreciate you doing this for us, and, and I think this is fantastic. And having been involved over this, the you know the last many years that mm -hmm. this has been going on, I also just want to thank you for your efforts because I know that you put a lot of time into <laughs> Georgia. I love Georgia. <laughs> yeah, even though it's I'm partial. Your home, home state. So yeah. thank you for this presentation. Thank you for all the work that you've done for us here. Um, it's going to be very impactful for, you know, behavior analysts who will m mostly be the consumers of this, but right. also, as you mentioned, all the families that they work with, and there's right. uh, quite a trickle down there, so Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.